The Lord be with you. Good morning to all you faithful and all of you online. My name is Bill Shoemaker. Welcome, all of you, to Grace Presbyterian Church of Tuscaloosa. We are celebrating Christ's universal love. We seek to do justice, embrace kindness, and walk humbly with God. For our guests, there are cards in the pew pockets in front of you. Please complete it. Be sure to check the box that, and add, have your name added to the e-mailing list. All you online worshipers, you are invited to post a greeting. Our sincere thanks to everyone who has participated in this year's Feeding Neighbors, Feeding Grace Stewardship Campaign. We are very grateful. Please know that more volunteers and more estimates of giving are vital to our ministry and our mission. Please visit Tuscaloosa, uh, gracetuscaloosa.org to participate. Today, we are grateful to welcome Carl Martin back to our pulpit and thankful to also announce that Carl will be with us through the entire month of December this year. Please take a moment after the service, if you have not already, to introduce yourself to Carl. We welcome Carl, and we thank you for your leadership through the word and the sacrament. When it comes time for your skills and finances, today's gospel story raises questions of acting on faith and assessing risk. Theologian Steve Garnis Holmes makes the following suggestion. Think of your whole life, your health, your skills, your abilities, your possessions, your time, your income, your loves and cares, and prayers, all of it, and imagine it is a plate of fine food given to you by the chef. You, as a waiter, are to serve some of it to your customers. It is for you to share, to act as a steward. How would God spend your life? How might God want you to give away your time, your skills, your resources? Listen and hear today's words of challenge and promise. Let us worship God. time set aside for thanksgiving is close at hand. What will you do with the gifts God has given you? We dedicate our gifts, our time, money, and talents to God. Praise God for these gifts and for the endless opportunities to serve that they represent. We praise God for all the ways in which our lives have been us. Generous God, accept our gifts and our lives this day. Loving God, accept our praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, we raise our hands and our voices to you in praise. For the beauty of creation, for the energy and excitement of children, for the sacred work of your church, we give you thanks. We long to be filled this day. Satisfy our hunger bread of life. Quench our thirst living water. Restore our soul's breath of inspiration. Fill us so that we may be renewed. Equip us to meet the needs of our neighbors in your name. For when opening our hands and our arms to all your beloved children, we receive even more from you. Thank you for the blessed communion of this assembly. May all we do praise and glorify your beloved child, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
Friends, we live in a crazy time and in a mixed up world. We often to struggle to discern what is right and then to actually do it. Thankfully, whenever we fail to do the right thing, whenever we do the wrong thing, God welcomes us in loving arms, trusting that God's desire to forgive is greater than our ability to mess up. Let us confess our sins together. Holy God of creation, you have blessed us with gifts necessary to illumine humanity's path to peace and reconciliation. We confess that we often squander those gifts and use them as if they had been given for our use alone. Worse than that, sometimes we fail to even acknowledge your gifts, surrendering the kingdom of your will to the chaos of human pride and fallibility. We fail to love you with our whole heart, and our actions towards our neighbors more closely resemble apathy than agape. We hear our neighbors' cries for justice and peace, but we're either too busy or too overwhelmed to respond. Remind us that we don't have to carry the weight of the whole world's problems on our shoulders. We just need to help lessen the load of our neighbors' burdens. One meal, one home, one hug, one vote, one shoulder, one neighbor at a time. Remind us that you give us all we need to accomplish your will. Forgive us when we forget. Through Jesus Christ, who died for us and lives within us. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. We have not been faithful in all things, but our God still welcomes us with patience, kindness, and love. As people of God's promise, receive God's forgiveness Embrace hope and faithfully respond. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We have hope. We will respond. Glory to God. Amen. Friends, having been reconciled with God, we are free to live at peace with each other. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Share the signs of Christ's peace with one another. going to find the irony of this in just a second. Um, so who here likes to ride roller coasters? Okay, yeah, I know, okay. You've never tried before. Okay, you don't know. Anybody climb trees? Yeah. Anybody do the teacup ride? Oh yeah, some people do that, yeah. And are there any of you guys that don't want to do a roller coaster because they seem too scared? Depends, you know, very much so. Yeah, I've seen, we did, we did a little bit of a trip this summer. We didn't do all of them. N anybody who doesn't like to do the teacup ride because it makes you dizzy, I'll say, that's me. We have a famous picture of someone on a teacup ride instead of me because I get barfy. Some people say dizzy. I'm just going to be honest with what it is. Um, so we're all made different. And some people like taking risks and some people like keeping their feet on the ground. And it's okay to either be a daredevil 
or to say you're going to stand back and see what happens and you are cautious. And just know that, you know, if you are that cautious person, you know, you've always got a parent or a trusted adult if you want to maybe try something different one day. Okay? Let's take a second for prayer. Okay? Dear God, thank you for the gift of these children in our church. And thank you for making each one unique and different, whether they're more of a daredevil or more of a let's wait and see what happens child. Amen. Let us pray. Faithful God, reveal your will to us that we may find purpose and meaning in your love. Eternal sustainer, breathe your spirit on us that we may proclaim new life in Christ. Teach us how to speak his words of forgiveness so that we can be your agents of reconciliation and peace in a broken and troubled world. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 11. Listen to a reading from the prophet. Listen to the word for the word of God. All of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Whoever has no money, come, buy food and eat. Without money at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the riches of feast. Listen and come to me. Listen and you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful loyalty to David. Look, I made him a witness to the peoples, a prince and a commander of peoples. Look, you will call a nation you don't know. A nation you don't know will run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel who has glorified you. Seek ye the Lord while he can still be found. Call him while he is ne yet near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and the sinful their schemes. Let them return to the Lord so that he may have mercy upon them to our God because he is generous with forgiveness. My plans aren't your plans, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my plans than your plans. Just as the rain and the snow come down from the sky and don't return there without watering the earth, making it conceive and yield plants and providing seed to the sower and food to the eater, so is my word that comes from my mouth. It does not return to me empty. Instead, it does what I want and accomplishes what I intend. The word of God given for all people. Thanks be to God. Listen as I read from the 68th Psalm, verses 1 through 10, 19, and 20. Listen for God's word. Let God rise up. Let his enemies scatter. Let those who hate him run scared before him. Like smoke is driven away, drive them away. Like wax melting before fire, let the wicked perish before God, but let the righteous be glad and celebrate before God. Let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Exalt the one who rides the clouds. The Lord is his name. Celebrate before him. Father of orphans and defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the lonely in their homes. He sets prisoners free with happiness but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. When you went forth before your people, God, when you marched through the wasteland, Selah, the earth shook. Yes, heaven poured down before God, the one from Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You showered down abundant rain, God. When your inheritance grew weary, you restored it yourself, and your creatures settled in it. In your goodness, God, you provided for the poor. Bless the Lord, the God of our salvation, supports us day after day. Selah. Our God is the God of salvation, and escape from certain death comes through God, my Lord. The 
God of our salvation supports us day after day. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Listen to a reading from Matthew. Listen once again for the word of God. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way the man with two earned two more. But the one who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I earned two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went off, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Holy wisdom, holy word, praise to you, O Christ. Friends, please join me in a spirit of prayer. Eternally generous God, giver of all things good and perfect, speak to me and speak through me so that the words I share today are the words you have prepared us to receive. May they be good news, and may they glorify Christ Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. The Bible spends a lot of time talking about money. The Bible focuses many of its stories and lessons on the topic of money. Many of Jesus' parables focus on money, material possessions, and how we as humanity deal with such things. We individually and as the church spend a great deal of time thinking about and working with money. In fact, this is the time of year when most congregations, this one included, undertake their annual stewardship campaign, the time when church leaders plan for, pray for, and sometimes plead for the finances necessary to pay the bills and proclaim the gospel in the coming year. In that respect, it's fortuitous that Matthew's parable of the three servants and their talents appears in the lectionary at this time of year. After all, it's a parable about money, money living under the assumed identity, under a pseudonym of Talents, and that particular word, talents, from the Greek talenton, adds all kinds of possibilities for a sermon focused on stewardship. Of course, one can also argue, and I'm about to, that a large part of what the lesson to be learned from this parable is not about what, when, and how we give to the church, but about how we encounter how we receive, and how we respond to what God gives us. In Matthew's day, a talent represents an enormous amount of money. 
a sum that the average laborer would earn over a span of 10 or perhaps 20 years of hard work. And friends, that's only one talent. The amount the master gives to the third servant. His peers get exponentially larger gifts from the master. This parable describes a master entrusting indescribably large sums of money to the care of the three servants. Each servant receives a different amount, but even the smallest amount, that one talent, is enough to forever change one's life. Of course, we all know that money can buy almost anything but happiness. Money rarely brings peace to a troubled soul. And often, even though money is an essential part of our life, large sums of money come with more problems than they solve. Why is it then that Jesus asks us to ponder a story of great wealth entrusted to simple servants? We know from studying the scriptures that God promises many things, but material wealth isn't one of them. In fact, some of the Bible's harshest critiques are leveled against the rich. When we understand, however, the talents in Matthew to be a metaphor for humanity's relationship with God, an existence in which you and I own nothing but have been given everything, then we can explore the power that gives us. We can enjoy that existence, and we can rejoice in thanksgiving. Friends, we can rejoice because God's generosity ex expectation. Just like the first century readers and hearers of Matthew's gospel could never imagine earning a talent or two, much less five, you and I can never ever do anything to earn God's favor. No one can, and no one ever will. Yet God entrusts us with life-changing gifts anyway. Life-changing for ourselves and for others. The gift of welcome. The gift of mercy. The gift of community. The gift of relationships. The gift of life. And the gift of eternity. These are all gifts from God given to us freely. The heft and impact of these things sometimes make them difficult to think of in terms of gifts, yet they are, and they are great and powerful gifts indeed. Not only are they great, but God's gifts are also good. The author of James tells us that God's gifts are both good and perfect good and perfect gifts shower down on us from the God of light and love, a God who never changes, and a God who never leaves us. And if God's gifts embody perfection, then any of life's bad, sad, or unsettling things come not from heaven, but elsewhere. Usually, such things come to us from more mortal sources. Earlier in his Matthean ministry, Jesus points out that most people know how to bless their children with good versions of what they need. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, Jesus asks, how much more will your heavenly parent give good things to those who ask for them? The truly amazing thing is, we don't even have to ask. We can rejoice because God's generosity is immense, overflowing with gifts that are perfect for us, in part because they are personalized for us. The parable clearly states that the servants receive gifts that differ greatly in value, and that makes the point that each endowment is unique. However, we err if we try to assign monetary value or worth to the portfolio of gifts we each enjoy. For example, I cannot play the flute, and I've tried in the past. There was a time back when I was in the band in high school that I wanted to be able to play every instrument, at least at a very basic level. 
I thought that would be really cool, and it would have been. <laughs> I was pretty good at the piano back in the day, and I could hold my own on the reed instrument, especially the saxophone. But no matter how hard I tried, I could not play the flute or any of the brass instruments for that matter. My mouth just wouldn't make the shape necessary for a quality sound to come out the other end of the instrument. My friend Cindy Fisher, on the other hand, daughter of Deborah and Brad, plays the flute beautifully, as if it's natural to her. That's because it is. Flute playing is one of the many things for which God has given her both talent and passion, and she shares it with us and with anyone who will listen willingly and lovingly. Friends, for too many years, powers from within the church and society have ignored and even silenced the gifts of God as expressed through diverse so-called unorthodox individuals. Women, people of color, lesbians, gays, transgender people, and others who dare to question or challenge so-called traditional norms. How the PCUSA thankfully recognizes all humans as beautiful and unique pieces in God's mosaic, many do not, and many will not. Tomorrow is the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance, a day each year to recognize those whose lives were taken from them as victims of anti-trans hatred and bigotry. Such hatred doesn't simply spring forth in a person unaided. Sadly, it almost always begins within a faith tradition centered on judgment and exclusion. And such bigotry is insidious. In what seems to be benign or even loving religious doctrine, the offending behavior is labeled detestable sin, while the offending individual is deemed worthy of love so long as they repent and eschew said behavior. Yet what is called behavior is, in reality, identity. The core of a precious life designed and created and given by God. God makes all people, and God gifts us uniquely to serve God's purposes. So yes, we, each and every one of us, receive incredibly valuable perfectly customized gifts from God through which God blesses humanity. But some of the gifts we receive are communal in nature. Those gifts offered freely and equally to all. Just more reasons to rejoice and give thanks. The greatest communal gift, indeed the greatest of all gifts, is the gift of life. Human life, eternal life, abundant life in Christ. That singular gift comes to us freely. Christ's redemption is ours wholly separate and entirely independent of anything we can say or do. As we learn in Scripture and the creeds of our faith, we, all of us, are God's. In life, in death, and in life eternal, we belong to God. And nothing will ever separate us from God's love, which redeems us, welcomes us, and holds us eternally in the arms of Jesus Christ. Nothing. But there are other communal gifts, good and perfect things whose origins must, by definition, be divine. Things which God calls us to proclaim and share by using the panoply of other gifts at our disposal. Many times, we may not even recognize these gifts as coming from God, but they are, they do. For example, we see the power of Jesus, the great physician at work, in diagnostic tests and in vaccines that prevent deadly disease or at least the worst effects of such illnesses. Through God's gifts of brain power and creativity applied in the field of medical science, we witness those who were lame walking. We encounter the sick who have been healed. We meet those previously condemned to death who live. Yet many people ignore God's life-saving gifts. Perversely, some often claim that to take advantage of such things exhibits a lack of faith in God. We are called to push back against such idolatries, and we must proclaim our thanks for these gifts 
with which God blesses all humanity. God's gifts aren't always easy to understand. God's gifts sometimes seem like they make our lives harder. And that's because they demand bold and risky action. And this is where we need to look at the actions of the third servant and the master's response to those actions. The third servant takes what the master gives, that one incredibly valuable talent, that life-transforming package of personalized gifts, the servant takes it and just buries it in the ground. He later returns the gift to the master fully intact and undamaged, just blows the dust off and hands it back. He claims that he didn't want to lose the gift or any part of it because he doesn't want to risk angering the master, but in fact, that's exactly what he does. Why didn't you just stick what I gave you in a money market or a savings account? Why couldn't you take such a valuable gift and at least find a low-yield investment with a guaranteed rate of return? And why does what you know about me, what you think you know about me, engender fear? What have I ever done to make you fearful? The master could ask. Now, as we all know and must never forget, there are times in life when we all find it hard to hang on. There are times when all we can do is dig a hole, jump in, and pull the hole in after us. Sometimes, based on life's events, that's all we can manage. And in such times, it's incumbent upon the rest of us to check on our siblings, to check on each other, to come by that hole, offer a hand up out of the depths of despair, to use our gifts to help comfort and encourage those in our midst who need it. There can be many reasons one may feel incapable of using God's gifts for a season. But fear of God or fear of Jesus should never be one of them. One of God's most common imperatives in Scripture is fear not, do not be afraid. And how can we fear the one who died for us, the one who conquered death for us, and the one who promises to remain with us always. Those who teach a vengeful, wrathful, unwelcoming God, pervert God's word, and ignore the life-affirming ministry of Jesus Christ. By preaching a God of judgment and exclusion, they cause others to live into an existence of closeted, suppressed terror. They inhibit the ability of others to live into the hope of God's love and grace, they suppress the confidence necessary for the full expression of each person's individual gifts. The master's anger toward the third servant comes from the fact that the servant uses fear as a reason for inaction. If, as the servant claims, he sees the master as someone who takes great risks in expectation of a great return, then the servant should find that inspiring not terrifying. The servant must emulate the actions of the giver and live into a life of bold, risky hope. And in that hope, we can rejoice and give thanks. Friends, we can rejoice because contrary to the statements of the third servant, contrary to whatever anyone else may ever say, God's gifts cannot, can never be lost. We can ignore them or we can choose not to use them, but they cannot be lost. God's gifts are perpetual and they are eternal. They are uniquely ours, designed to work with our own spirits, our own minds, and our own voices, our own unique voices, so that all God's children contribute to the communion of the kingdom. The God who gives you life has blessed each one of you, each one of us, with immeasurable gifts. Rejoice and use them boldly. They make the community and the world a much better place. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Beloved children of God, please join with me and with believers of every time and place as we confess our faith in God. In the beginning, God formed humanity from the soil of the earth to be God's beloved children, created like God to dwell with God in abundance. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, one community. Jesus came to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, teaching us by word and deed he healed the brokenhearted, ate with outcasts, and forgave sinners. Jesus calls all to repent and believe the gospel, and he delivers us from death to life eternal. God's Holy Spirit is poured out on all people, causing children to prophesy, youth to see visions, and elders to dream dreams. The Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. All glory and praise be to God. Amen. I would just like to thank Loaves and Fishes for the blessings that they have been to the community and to myself. Um, I became disabled some years back from an injury on my job where I was working with state clients in mental health. And uh, I was injured and have to, had to come off work due to those injuries. And living on a fixed income, it has been a blessing for me, truly a great blessing. And I'm quite sure others in the community that receive the help from loaves and fishes. So I would just like to thank the church for what they are doing for the community and for others that is in need. And like I said before, it has been a blessing. And thank you. Hi, my name is Juanita Shera. I work full time. I heard about this program and decided to come over to see if I could qualify. I did qualify. I have six members in my household and we really enjoy the food that we get. Uh, it's very beneficial to me and my family. We do a lot of fun things with the food. We mix and match uh, different vegetables, different meats, and the kids really enjoy the program. We really enjoy the staff. They are so nice and kind to us, and we thank you all for allowing us to be able to come to the program. Thank you. God of love, you love this world, and you choose to accomplish that love through us. You have given us gifts with which to bless this world, to heal the hurting, to feed the needy, to encourage the downtrodden. Stir up those gifts in us, and give us love and courage to share them by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit and the presence of your loving Son, Jesus. Amen.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Unending, uh, gracious God, unending source of blessing, unceasing well of grace, we thank you for the abundance of your goodness. May he see us heal the hurting, feed the needy, and encourage the Please be seated. When Jesus gathered followers and friends together for a Passover meal, he didn't send out engraved invitations. He didn't put up a velvet rope to keep out the riffraff. When the time came to birth a new covenant and a new tradition, Jesus didn't deny bread to Peter, even though Peter would soon deny him. Jesus didn't pass the cup around Judas, even though Judas would soon pass Jesus off to the executioner. This table is God's table, precisely because all are welcome. Jesus welcomes us and none are turned away, ever. We come together as one and draw strength from our host, the meal, and from each other. Jesus says to all, come. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Eternal and holy God, in every season of our lives, in every place we dwell, it is right to greet you with boisterous shouts of praise and beauteous songs of thanksgiving, for we belong to you. In every time and place, you are there for us, with us, doing a new thing. You were there, Creator God, before everything, before anything, from the vast chaos of nothingness, your holy mind called all things into being. Even as we fail to recognize the goodness and beauty of your imaginative sustaining gifts, you were there, loving us and calling us back to you. When human selfishness and greed led to injustice, you were there, freeing the oppressed and calling them to be your covenant people. Through repeated cycles of human forgetfulness, rebellion, and repentance, you were there, merciful one, loving, teaching, forgiving, and as always, gifting the children of your creation with all we need to live into the plans you have made for us. Yes, God, you were always there. When the time was right, you came to dwell with us as Jesus. You were there as a vulnerable infant, crying and cooing in a borrowed manger. You were there, Jesus, demonstrating the healing power of love, proclaiming the dawning of God's kingdom, declaring the reign of justice, forgiveness, and peace. You were there, Lord Christ, around a table with your friends just before your arrest, when you took bread, blessed it, broke it open, and said, this is my body given for you. Take it, all of you, eat it, and remember me. And after the meal, merciful Jesus, you took a cup. You filled it and shared it with each of your disciples and friends, saying, this is the birth of a new covenant, my blood spilled for you. Take it, drink, and always remember me. You were there, Jesus, in the garden, on the cross, and in the grave, but then you were there sharing new life with Mary, with those headed to Emmaus, and once again with your disciples in a room around a meal. So it is that whenever we gather to share this meal, we remember your loving grace and mercy, risen Christ, until you come again, and come again you will. We remember Jesus, and you are here, here with us through the power of the Holy Spirit, the one given to comfort, guide, and inspire us. You dwell within us, Holy Spirit. You fill us, Holy Spirit. And you go with us as we proclaim the good news in all that we do. Abide with us, God, as we continue to your heart. We pray to you in the name of your beloved child who teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Mother and Father God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will the service please come forward? The gift of God for the people of God. The bread of heaven.
Friends, these are the gifts of God for God's people. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for time in your presence, time at your table, time together with friends. We thank you for time to pray to you, to praise you, and to ask for your guidance. Having been filled with bread and cup, fill us once again with your spirit that we may go forth and do your will and be the light that you created us to be. In Christ's name, amen. as we transition from this holy and sacred time of worship into a week of work, which is also sacred and holy when done by God's people, we do so in joy and thanksgiving, knowing that regardless of our age, race, gender, gender identity, income, faith, or any other reason, we are all God's beloved children. The joy of knowing that in life, death, and life for all eternity, we belong to to creator, redeemer, and sustainer God. And the joy of knowing that these immeasurable, incomparable, and unconditional gifts are ours to treasure, and more importantly, to share. And now may the God of grace, the Lord of life, and the spirit of all truth be with you this day and every day of your journey throughout eternity. Amen. <laughs>